Well, good morning, Walden Church. You know, in preparing for uh, the sermon today, I was reminded uh, about a restaurant that was around the corner from my parents' house. I loved it. It was probably one of the only restaurants I even went to uh, growing up, and it was called Ole Frijoli, and it was an all-you-can-eat Mexican and American buffet. So it was all-you-could-eat fried chicken, all-you-could-eat mashed potatoes, and all-you-could-eat enchiladas, all-you-can-drink sodas, and all-you-can-make ice cream cones. That's right. So after any special event that my family attended, the question was always, Dad, can we go to Ole Frijoli? So Dad has an orchestra concert. Dad, can we go to Ole Frijoli? My brother had a clarinet recital. Dad, can we go to Ole Frijoli? Uh, we just went out to church that morning. Dad, can we go to Ole Frijoli? Uh, my mom had a root canal. Dad, can we go to Ole Frijoli, right? And so, and whenever we ate there, you would have needed a wheelbarrow to wheel me out. I ate so much food, there was no cork on me when I was a kid, there's no stopping me. Most of the time, it was a race to see how much food I could cram into my stomach. I was like an 11-year-old burglar, <laughs> and I wanted to steal all the food, and the only way to steal it all was to eat it. And I really didn't give much thought to what I ate. I mean, why would I? I was young, and I wasn't getting any fatter. But I wanna to talk to you today about another shift that we can all make in our lives, another thing we can do that would take us a little closer to living our best life. And this is something that I have been thinking a lot about these last two months, probably uh, since the last time you ever saw me in a suit a few months ago. Something maybe a lot of us have been thinking about since we all got quarantined at home. How can we make the shift in our lives to moving to being more intentional about what we eat and how we treat our bodies and being people of intention when it comes to nutrition and exercise? In other words, it's do or diet time. Because <laughs> generally there are two types of people uh, who watch what they eat. Uh, one would be people who are on a diet. But uh, the word diet just means uh, what you are eating. So technically, everyone is on a diet. Uh, but most of us, when we say that, we mean we're purposely observing a particular diet in order to stay healthy or you know, you're trying to lose weight. But before we start going even further into this uh, sermon today, you're probably confused and you're scratching your head and you're thinking to yourself, is he serious? I mean, are we really gonna talk about food and what we eat today? Yes, because let's face it, out of all the things that separate us and make us different, every single person who's watching this right now, we all eat, right? And typically we might on average eat three meals a day. And if we're to live our lives as men and women who understand that everything we do has implications about what we believe. And then it only seems natural that food and how we treat food is a very big deal. I mean, let's get serious. The very first Bible story, right, in the Bible that involves people it is about food and what we should eat and what we shouldn't eat. Ezekiel 16 says, Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and the needy. When you look back in your head and you were taught the Sunday school lesson of Sodom and Gomorrah, is that what you remember? Is that how you remember the story that Sodom was destroyed by fire from heaven because they were overfed and unconcerned about those who were hungry? Now, of course, we can talk about food and eating in church because food touches every single corner of our lives. In America, our farmers produce a ton of corn. <laughs> so much corn that corn products go into everything you eat, even chicken nuggets, even soda. 
So our farmers need a massive amount of petroleum-based fertilizers. And right now, because of everything going on in the Middle East, gas prices are always fluctuating. So the cost of your food and the cost of gas are all tied to what we eat. Another aspect, immigrant workers make up between 50 and 80% of the people who pick your fruits and vegetables. So the immigration debate is also directly related to what you are gonna eat for dinner tonight. One more, what about uh, grocery store employees? What about how they're paid or whether they receive medical benefits? Where you shop for groceries, wherever you get the best deal, right? Or wherever you get the cheapest food, or do you shop someplace that actually takes care of their employees? You probably heard recently that approximately 1.5 million part-time and full-time Walmart and Sam's Club associates in the US can now earn college degrees or learn trade skills without the burden of debt. Walmart is committing to invest nearly $1 billion over the next five years in career-driven training and development for its employees. So here are some other fun facts for you. America is getting fatter. Almost 65% of people in the United States are overweight or obese. Americans ages 20 to 74 are 50% more likely to be obese than adults who lived back in the 70s. And even though most Americans would say that a healthy diet is important to them, over half of America believes that their diet is fine. We're also not the best judges of how healthy we are. Only one quarter of Americans right now are on a diet to lose weight. Why, why so low? Well, studies also show that Americans don't like being restricted or told what to do. What? No. <laughs> Only 4% of Americans avoid preservatives and processed and fast foods. So that means there are not very many of us who are hardcore dieters in terms of making the best food choices. 51% of Americans call frozen vegetables salad or homemade. And 34% of Americans would prefer to cater a holiday dinner or go out to eat than eat a homemade meal. And then just the other day, I found this quote from a, a Christian news website. It says, a new study surmises that among Christians in the US, particularly Baptists, that there is a significant relationship between being religious and being obese. We usually think of religion as contrasting negative behaviors, doctors say, but Baptists, as well as most fundamentalist groups, place great emphasis on separating the mind or the soul from the body, which may lead to overeating. And lastly, according to USA Today, Americans' extra weight costs the nation as much as $93 billion a year in medical bills. So, food and how we treat it is a very big deal. Jesus was a Hebrew. And that means he would have observed kashrut, uh, which is where we get the English word kosher, which means legitimate, it means acceptable, it means permissible, it means genuine, it means authentic. And many of the basic laws of kashrut are derived from the Torah's book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Islam is uh, related, but it's on a different system and they call theirs halal. Uh, these dietary rules, of course, they vary from faith to faith, but examples would be excluding certain food altogether uh, or not eating certain food along with another food, having it on the same plate, or preparing a food, but having to prepare it in a very specific way. Now, the good news is, American Christians, you can eat whatever you want. <laughs> Amen. And I'll see you all over at Magnolia Diner after church for some chicken fried steak or their pork chops, which are the best. Or maybe God still does care about what we eat and what we do with our bodies. I mean, like I said earlier, humanity's first sin involved the desire for food. And if we believe our God is the God, 
and he lives and he knows uh, when sparrows fall out of trees and he knows the number of hairs that are on our head, then we also have to believe this is a God who is interested in how we speak, how we handle our money, how we care for our bodies, and how we live with food. Now, if I buy food from the farmer's market, the farmer who grew it hands it to me, and the food is grown in soil close to where I live. The sun that shines on me is the same sun that shines on it, so this food does not grow very far from my house. There is something about eating locally grown food that makes me aware, makes me attuned, makes me slow down. Because the average food that's in your house right now travels 1,200 miles from where it was grown to restaurants and to grocery stores. In fact, studies say that if each family in the U.S. were to eat just one homegrown meal a week, we would save 800 million barrels of oil. Did you know that shipping food around the world is America's second largest expenditure of oil? Your first is your car. And even though you could walk to the grocery store, right? You say, you know what, I'm gonna save gas, I'm gonna walk to the grocery store. Your fish that came from New York City, your bananas that came from Ecuador, your tomatoes, that came from Holland, and your cheese that came from France used a lot of gas. Even though you walk to the store, you still use a lot of gas when you buy food. Why? Because all your food is flown on planes or shipped on boats all over the world just so that you could have a salad. There is no such thing as seasons anymore when it comes to food. You know, we can buy any fruit or vegetable in the winter and we have no idea how it got there. You can get artichokes and tomatoes literally every day of the year. I can buy tomatoes, right? I can buy four small ones in a little plastic box. I can pick out the medium sized ones and put them in a plastic bag or I can get those huge beefsteak tomatoes in the middle of February in a snowstorm. Where was it grown? How did it get here? I don't know. I am totally disconnected from the food that I eat. But is that God's plan? I know it's hard to see uh, in Texas sometimes, but God did make seasons. And we have changes in the weather, just like we have changes in the soil. Why do, we, why do we have that? Well, it's for Sabbath rest. God made seasons so the ground would be able to rest. And that we would be able to rest along with the soil. I mean, we're in September now, so typical food that would be in season in September would be apples, grapes, green beans, uh, radicchio, corn, zucchini, cabbage, cauliflower. Can you imagine living in a time where if you wanted to eat an apple, you only had two choices. You could eat a canned apple, or you could wait, right? Wait until it grows again. Because what does waiting through the season make you do? Well, it makes you appreciate that apple all the more, doesn't it? Everything has rhythm. Life has rhythm. The world has rhythm. And what happens when we detach ourselves from that rhythm? What happens when we separate ourselves from the cycle that God created? Who eats their dinner or who eats their meal or who eats their vegetables uh, right out of their garden, their own garden in their backyard? You have a garden in your own backyard and you can actually pick food and eat it. It's amazing, isn't it? it? It was dirt, then it was seeds, then it became food and you watched it grow. And when you watched it grow and you were part of that, <clears throat> that cycle with that plant, then you were, you were connected with all of it. 
you are connected with the soil, the water, the time, right? And it springs up out of the ground and then you get to eat it. And you can just eat it, right? It's right there, it's available to you, but you can't eat it whenever you want. You become part of the process, you become part of the rhythm, and the process forces you to have patience, doesn't it? The earth that God made produces food in seasons, and those seasons force us to wait and to eat slower and to eat healthier. Now, I haven't spoken to anybody about this. I don't even know if this is possible or if anybody would like this, but the church owns all of this beautiful grass, especially over here by the fire station and the school. But what would happen if we just took a day and we tilled the soil and we made a community garden? Eating is so connected to survival. And when you and I eat a hamburger at Whataburger, how disconnected am I then from that food? We don't appreciate it like we should. We don't appreciate the time it took for it to get to us or that it was prepared for us. In fact, if it takes time, we complain. If your food takes longer than 15 minutes to get to you, you start complaining. We consume it until we're stuffed, and then the food becomes common, casual, mundane. Food does not stay sacred anymore. It ceases to have rhythm. It ceases to teach us patience. It ceases to teach us restraint. In fact, I'll go so far as to say the technology of being able to acquire food fast separates us from the beauty of what food is. Do we live our lives patiently with God? Or do we sacrifice that for convenience and for cost? Genesis 1 says, God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit and seed with it according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. Genesis chapter 2 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. These are the first pages of Scripture. God deems creation good, and then he creates people to care for and have responsibility for creation. He puts us in charge. So how we connect with food and the world around us is important. It's sacred. It has theology. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You know, in the Old Testament, God lived in a temple. When Jesus walked the earth, God lived in a temple. And it was a beautiful building. It was ornate. It was intricate. And if you wanted to go and talk to God, you couldn't. Right? You'd have a priest go in and intercede for you. But today the scriptures say, we are the temple. We are the dwelling place. Paul even goes on to say, you are not your own, so honor God with your body. Honor God with your lifestyle. Does the food we eat and the way we treat it, does it honor God? Comedian Phil Hartman, he used to have a segment on Saturday Night Live called Deep Thoughts with Jack Handy. And this was one of his quotes. He said, if God dwells inside us, like some people say, I sure hope he likes enchiladas because that's what he's getting. We need to learn how to offer our bodies to God, to submit our will to his. This means enjoying the good food that God has given to us, but not compromising our health by eating too much or eating too little. Romans 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. In the Old Testament, God was very concerned with his temple. 
God was so concerned with his dwelling place. The Bible records every exact and every extreme measurement and process by which the temple was to be built. He didn't just say, oh, bah, I don't care. Make it uh, purple. Today, God feels the same way about this temple, the temple of our body. Since he dwells in us, we need to keep the temple in good state, in good repair. Now, maybe you've tried and failed with a diet or exercise or trying to quit smoking or trying to stop drinking or you stop and fail because you're like, nah, it's not worth it. I'd rather have french fries. I'd rather have potato chips. I'd rather eat big handfuls of Cheez-Its. Well, what about it isn't doing it for you? I mean, the Lord made you, right? Maybe it's because we always do it for ourselves. But what if we changed that thinking and started doing it for God, right? Because the scriptures say this is God's temple. So my body should take a size and shape that honors God, that brings him joy. So I want to give you seven uh, pieces of advice to maintaining a healthy temple. And the first is we need to move from being stuffed to being satisfied. From stuffed to satisfied. Proverbs 23 says, Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat, for drunkards and gluttonous become poor and drowsiness clothes them in rags. From stuffed to satisfied means I have to learn to eat until I am satisfied. Too often we eat until we feel stuffed. And I still have my grandmother's voice in my head to finish everything on my plate. And half the time, after I finish everything on my plate, if anyone else has stopped eating at the table, I'll reach over and eat what's on their plate because I don't want it to go to waste. Problem is, it goes to waste, right? So I have to learn to identify when I feel full and to stop. Then go from gulping to tasting. Philippians 3 says, For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. When we move from gulping to tasting, we allow God to allow us to enjoy the food that we're eating. I mean, let the meal become an experience. It's not a race. I mean, I was the oldest of six kids. If you didn't eat what was on your plate, you, you lost, right? You lost the race. Remember, remember last week, I was telling us we all need to slow down. Slowing down at the food, at the dinner table, that's a good place. When you eat, put your food down between bites. Put your fork on the table between bites. Talk between bites. Engage in conversation. Third, go from guilty to thankful. You know, my grandfather wrote this dinner prayer for our family. He said, Dear Lord, we thank you for your care. The food we eat, the clothes we wear, be with us always everywhere. You know, saying a prayer before your meal, it's going to sum up the theology behind feeling thankful for the God who provides for your food. Stop and give thanks for your food. Stop and give thanks for provision in your life. Maybe you have a family prayer, something that you learned as a child. Maybe it's time to pick that up, revisit that again. Fourth, let's move from being random to planned. You know, another reason that we don't control what we eat is we don't have a menu. And if we did, we could eat whatever was on the menu. But if you actually planned out your meal, even if it was only a day in advance, you could control what you ate rather than just wait for somebody else to control it for you. Let's also move from fast food to sit down meals. You know, last week again, talked to you about slowing down. 
enjoying your cup of coffee. Well, what about trying to stop eating on the run or in your car or just standing up over the sink or over the counter in your kitchen? It's time to recapture the joy and the fellowship that meals create. You know, you can eat with another person, eat with a loved one. We know the early church ate together as part of their own worship services. Acts 2 says every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. This is why you have uh, fellowship in a church. This is why our church still has potlucks. You know, other churches no longer have potlucks. They, they got too big, but we are a community church, and so we want to honor the tradition of Acts chapter 2, and we absolutely have to share a meal together. As often as you can, sit down with other people and have a meal. And if you, if you haven't attended a potluck yet at our church, I would, and, and you just never stick around, man, I would really, I would really encourage it. And maybe you're a younger person and you want to meet the older generation, or maybe you're uh, in the older generation and you want to meet the younger. Please make the attempt to include potluck dinners at your church as part of your family activities. Help model for all of the church children and church grandchildren the importance of sharing meals with other believers. Six, let's move from drink options to water. You know, for two weeks, just try drinking five or more glasses of water a day. So often we think that uh, we we have all these options and we enjoy sodas and we enjoy teas uh, or other drinks, but a lot of the times those aren't even drinks. You know, Coke, Coke is not a drink. It's an invention. It's a creation. What, what beverage that, that you love is replacing water? Because if you don't stay hydrated, your physical performance can suffer. You'll feel lethargic. You'll feel weak. You won't have energy. This is particularly important during uh, exercise, of course. You need to stay hydrated. But also during weeks and months where it's hot. You should be consuming water. Your brain and your memory are strongly influenced by your hydration levels. Do you find it that I don't remember things as well anymore? Well, how much water are you drinking? Research has shown that even a headache is one of the most common symptoms of dehydration. What's more is some studies have shown that drinking water can help relieve headaches, especially in people who have frequent headaches. I have frequent headaches. And sometimes when a headache won't go away with just a couple of aspirin, I'll tell my wife, I say, I'm gonna drown this headache. And I will literally drink full glasses of water back to back to back to back until it's gone. Increasing hydration can even help decrease constipation. There's evidence that water intake can help prevent reoccurrence in people who have gotten uh, kidney stones in the past. Drinking plenty of water will definitely help you lose weight. Let's move from a passive life to an active life. You know, last week we talked about being busy and rushing around, but being busy doesn't necessarily mean that you are active, right? Being busy doesn't mean that you're fit. Pick one small way that you can be more active. I don't know, challenge your wife or your spouse and say, uh, you know, hide the remote from me. And I'll search, search the house to try to find it. S- do stretches in the morning. Do something that brings your energy level up. Like it or not, God has chosen to make our bodies his dwelling place. He didn't ask for our opinion. He just told you, I am moving in, right? And if Jesus told you today, hey, I'm coming over to your house for dinner, like he did with Zacchaeus, What would you do? If you had the day to prepare, you'd probably go home and clean, right? You clean the house. And second, you would probably cook a home-cooked meal. Okay. This is how we should treat our bodies all the time, right? Jesus lives here. So we should give him the best accommodations possible. On Sunday morning, when the pastor is standing before the communion table, that is a time to 
be attentive. That the way we think about food, right, because it's the bread and the cup, is also the way we think about God. That the table is a place where God's presence indwells us. The communion meal that the disciples ate with Jesus was the Passover dinner. It was a Seder. So it was herbs and lamb and eggs and four glasses of wine. 1 Corinthians 11 says, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, we say, For God so loved the world that he gave right? And in our prayers over a meal, we often thank God for the blessing that he gives. We even sometimes recognize the blessing of the food, and we ask the food be a blessing to us, or we ask for the blessing to fall on the hands that prepared it. I hope that also we are praying that our bodies that receive this food become a blessing to the one who blesses. So may your love for food spill over into your love for God. And may your taste buds recall all the connectivity that they should have with creation. May you be conscious this week of knowing when to be satisfied with God's blessings. And above all, may you taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for food. And more than likely, right after this, we are all going to go and take food and consume food and be in places where food is being made. Lord, may we reconnect with food. This is something that you created to give us joy, to sustain us, to help us live in cycle and in rhythm with the world. Lord, may we be reconnected with the earth, reconnected with the seasons, reconnected with the food you've made. May we recognize the blessing that we have to enjoy food whenever. And may we treat food as something that is sacred and holy and important for our health and nutrition. Help us to learn to have a good relationship with food. Help us to learn to create our bodies as a living sacrifice to you, a holy temple to you a temple that we are proud of and that brings us joy, but also that brings you joy. Help us to live in your creation the way you designed. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us online today. Don't forget, we do have uh, services every single Sunday, and we would love to have you back in the church. Uh, we have two services every single Sunday. Uh, Sunday morning at 9.30, we have our traditional service with our choir. We sing hymns, we sing the old standards. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary worship service. We have a worship team, and at that same time, we also have a children's program, and we also have youth group. We also have youth group every single week on Wednesdays at 6. You can send your kids over on their skateboards or their bikes. We'll even feed them dinner, and we'll send them back home to you at 7.30. Uh, we'd love to see them. We love having new visitors. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.